again, if you if you look at Kotlin as a language, one of its big selling points um, is improved support for working safely with null. And this is true. It also gives us more opportunities to think about how we use null in our programs because we do have better language support. And so on some level, sort of thinking about this today, like, you know, avoiding null whenever possible is not a bad strategy in your programs. But we'll also talk about some places where you need to use null, um, where it's an appropriate value to indicate certain things about, you know, the lack of information in your program or something like that. And so Kotlin makes sure that you work with null safely, and it's good at it, right? This is a place where Kotlin's uh, compiler uh, tools and compiler inference, sort of type inference, comes in handy, right? So we've seen Kotlin infer the types of variables through expressions and stuff like that. But one of the things that the Kotlin compiler can do when it infers types it, is that it can also determine when at various points in your program a particular variable might hold a null value and force you to work with that kid. All right, so just to back up and review for a minute, um, remember that in Kotlin, by default, our variables cannot be assigned a null value. So null is a keyword in the language that we can use. But by default, um, if we declare a variable, once Kotlin has inferred, so the other thing about this example too is that Kotlin's default is to infer that a variable has a non-null type. So on line two of that first example, I'm creating a variable called i. I'm assigning it the literal value four. Kotlin is going to infer that to be an int, not a nullable int. Okay, uh, same thing with the string value. So if I want these to be nullable, I need to declare that I'm going to assign them a null value. I can do that one of two ways. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I can only do it one way, right? So if I wanted this to be a nullable int, I have to explicitly specify a type, right? Kotlin will, um, I'm trying to think if this is true, but Kotlin will essentially never infer the type for a nullable variable. Right, you always have to specify it explicitly. Um, you might think about why that's the case. So why doesn't, why can't I do something like this? Like why doesn't, so why, why, why can I, why do I have to specify a type for a nullable variable? Here I'm telling Kotlin it's gonna be nullable, I'm assigning null to it. Why can't Kotlin infer the type of this variable? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, like what is this, right? Yeah, so null's a, a, a reference that I can assign to any variable. Um, this actually might even work. Yeah, it works, right? Um, so, but the type of this variable is gonna be object, right? So if I try to assign like, if I try to assign it a, another value, right? Now it's angry um, because the type it's inferred for i is, uh, is, a, null, is, is a nullable object. So here, if I say this is a nullable int, now I can set its value to other things and it's gonna work fine, okay? And so, again, contrast this with Java, right? So in Java, by default, every variable, um, you know, every variable that can store an object reference can store null. That's the default, and there is no other option. In Kotlin, every variable that can store an object reference uh, by default will not store null. And I have to kind of twist Kotlin's arm a little bit to get it to store null, all right? Um, and so, you know, again, when possible in your, in your Kotlin programs, don't use null. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if I do this, I think it infers object. That's what I suspect. Let's let's see if we can figure it out. So let's try to say, let's try to assign it an object and see if it, it will do this. Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> right. So th this is a place where um, this is a pl so Kotlin actually has a special type for this. I've forgotten this. Um, the type. Can you see that over there? It says nothing was expected. So Kotlin has a special type called nothing question mark that is used when I assign something uh, directly to null. And I'm pretty sure that, no I, I'll have to look this up again, but I'm pretty sure that as you would expect, nothing does not store an actual type. 
right? Nothing is like a special type that indicates the only value this variable can store is null. Now, I don't know why you would do this, right? Because there's not a lot, I'm sort of boxed myself into a corner here. There's not a lot I can do with i at this point. I can't assign it like any other type of value, right? Um, but yeah, so it looks like the default we get is nothing. I suspect I can assign it, I can reassign it null, right? Um, that'll work, right? Um, so as long as I just want to assign null to this variable, I'm in good shape, right? I don't want to do anything else with it. Um, and so to break out of this, I have to tell Kotlin more about what this would be in the future, right? Great question. So our, our best strategy, well, I shouldn't say our best strategy, one strategy or a good strategy is to try to avoid null, right? And particularly if you're coming from a language like Java that doesn't give you a lot of tools for working with null, you may think that this is the right strategy. In a lot of ways it is, right? I mean, you can certainly avoid these kind of dumb cases in Java where things end up being null because, you know, in this case, my if else statement isn't exhaustive, right? Um, you know, I, I wanted, my goal here was for S to not be null once I got to line nine, um, but because of how I wrote this conditional, I missed a case. And so now this code is going to crash when it runs, right? Um, so, you know, again, and we, we've looked, I mean, you can, you can just poke fun at the, the, the Java compiler all day long about how it handles null, right? Now, if you write this in Kotlin, this is sort of interesting, right? Um, so what's gonna happen here? Anybody wanna take a guess? You could run, run the code or just ask. I mean, this is a place where, again, Kotlin's compiler, the, the, the kind of, you know, type inference, the analysis that the compiler is capable of doing comes in handy here. Anybody know, anyone wanna guess what warning I'm gonna get? This actually give me a compiler error. This code won't compile. Why not? Oh. Syntactically, it's correct. There's no syntax er syntax errors here. But why won't why won't Kotlin oh. compile this code? I think it's written on the slide. Um, so yeah, we we could try it. Right. So we when we talked about. One of the cool things we talked about in Kotlin for avoiding null is the fact that we can use if as an assignment. But when we do that, it has to be exhaustive, right? So Kotlin is gonna force us to make sure that some branch of this if else assignment is hit. And this is essentially a way to force us to be intentional about what's happening here and avoid cases where we might accidentally not hit one of the branches and the value would end up being null, right? So this is really kind of a form of null avoidance, right? I, I wouldn't have to do this, right? I mean, Kotlin could have said, well, if you don't hit either branches, I'll just let S be null, and I'll infer the type of S to be a nullable string because the branches that do have values in them have strings, but it did, did, didn't do that, right? So now the way to fix this is to make sure that, um, to make sure that I hit one of the branches and then I know that S is not nullable. So this is not gonna cause any error. So again, there, you know, there, so when I would, if I was telling you how to, how to work with null and Kotlin, I would say, well, first of all, see, think about if you can rewrite the code that you're using to avoid null, okay? But there are some places where null is a good value, right? So let's, let's talk a little bit about those because again, Kotlin makes working with null safe. And so we can, um, we, we can work with it more confidently and we can use it in places where it might actually be appropriate. One of the places where Kotlin uh, is forced to, um, to deal with null is whenever you're making calls into Java libraries. So remember that Java libraries, uh, Java doesn't force you to do anything special about how you handle this dangerous value. And so if you're calling into a Java library, the reference you get back might be to something that is that could store null and that's one place where null will creep into your program. Um, I believe that Kotlin has support for uh, interoperating with Java code that does have better checks for this. There are some ways to do this in Java using annotations and other ways. Um, but a lot of libraries will pass back things that are um, variables that could store a null roughly. So that's one place where you'll, you'll, you'll see them. But the other place is that, you know, there's times when you actually want to use null particularly when designing data models, to indicate that a particular 
uh, property, every piece of data might ha not have a particular property, right? So this is sort of like a, a little bit of a contrived example, but you will find yourself when you start modeling data working with cases like this. Um, if you look at some of the Kotlin code that we have for working with data for 125, you know, we do have, um, you know, data models where we have nullable fields, and this is the reason, right? So let's imagine that I'm modeling data about people using this person class, and so far everybody's got a first and last name, but let's say I want to add some piece of data about the people in my model that is not shared by every person, right? So not every person is going to have this field. The one that, the only one I could come up with on short notice was a middle name, but that's sort of a dumb example. I'm sure you guys can come up with better ones. Um, but let's say that we want to add this to our model, and we also want to represent the fact that some people don't have a middle name, like legally don't have a middle name, right? Um, and I know some people don't have a first or last name either, but whatever, that's okay. Um, so you'll see this handled, I think, in two ways, right? Um, one way is to essentially use what's called a sentinel value, okay? So a sentinel value is a special value that you set aside in your model to indicate missing data, right? And if we wanted to be, you know, more clever about this, we could say, um, let's call this, well, I'd have to put it inside the, we'll talk about classes next week. I could create like a constant value for this. It's like no middle name and that's like a empty string. So here what I'm going to say is that, you know, if I don't um, specify a middle name, I get this empty string. People that don't have a middle name have an empty string. But everybody uh, in my model has a middle name. Every one of the person objects has a middle name. Um, none of them are null, right? I don't have any null types here. These are all non-nullable types. I just have a special sentinel value that I use to indicate missing. And this, this can work, right? This is not um, a bad approach. It depends on the data you're working with. Um, you know, so, but let's, um, let's look at another way of doing this. Um, one of the problems you run into is that sometimes the sentinel value, sometimes there is no sentinel value that you can use, right? That's a safe value. Um, other times, this starts to get confusing, right? So if you think about different types of data that you might want to store, there are cases where like any value that I might stick in there is actually potentially valid. And so I don't have a way to indicate that there's a missing piece of data. This is particularly true with like numeric, numeric data, right? Um, so instead, I might actually really just want to allow this piece of data to be missing from certain instances of this class, okay? Um, the way I would do this, um, you know, and again, this is more common when I'm working with numeric data, so the way I would do this now, so now I've redesigned my model, my data class, to store um, two fields that are required, that are non-nullable, and now I've made this last piece of data, the middle name, nullable. And so I can now have instances of this class where the middle name is null, and I've also set the default to be null. Right, so I think we looked at data classes a couple weeks ago, but just as a reminder, you know, this syntax establishes what the fields are in my data class, and conveniently, I can also specify default values for them. That, so I don't have to provide all the values in the constructor. So this second call sets the middle value, middle name value to an actual legitimate uh, value. The first call does not, right? And so if we say, let's print new person dot middle. Now let's print person dot middle and this will work right so um, I think my niece actually has a middle name but I don't know what it is um, so so anyway so this this is a and, and again this is a very common way of doing this right there are times when there's no valid value right to stick in and I really just want to be able to use null to indicate missing data and again Colin because of what we're going to talk about for the rest of the hour I actually have some really nice ways of working with null values. And so you shouldn't be afraid of this, right? I don't, I, I was thinking about it, I was like, I don't want to scare people into not using null and column because it actually turns out that it's pretty easy to use. Okay, any questions at this point before we go on? Yeah. 
Oh, right. So my, yeah, so my data model doesn't specify that their middle name is modifiable. So if I wanted it, if I want their names to be something that can be modified, I'll change them from vowels to bears, right? And then I can modify them for you. You can change your name if you want to. There's a form. Depends on the state you're in. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at um, let's look at the tools that Kotlin provides to us for working with null, uh, because we're going to need to do this from time to time. We're going to have a variable that it's it's going to potentially hold null. Kotlin's going to know what that variable is, and so so these tools are actually not they're they're not um, they're not uh, things that you get to use. They're things that you are forced to use by the language. Okay, so. The first thing to think about is where does null, how do we get in trouble with null? Like what, what, what causes problems with it? And the place where we get in trouble with null is when we're trying to follow null references. So in Java, when we talk about objects, we talk about the dot operator, right? The dot operator follows a reference that we provide to an object and allows us to access the fields or the methods that are defined on that object, right? And this is what causes this problem, which is that if I don't have a valid reference and I try to follow it, I get a crash, right? And again, this is actually a runtime error. This is not a compile time error. This happens in front of the user, right? It doesn't happen at your desk as you're working on your, your compiling your code. So Kotlin won't even compile this code, right? And, and the playground, unfortunately, again, doesn't do a good job of distinguishing between these two cases, right? But this is a compile time error. It's not a runtime error, right? It means that it happens during development. It's something that you are forced to fix before you release your code or deploy it or whatever, right? You cannot build a Kotlin program if you do not handle this case properly, right? Um, and the error message here from the compiler is happily pointing out for us a couple of the cases that we can, a couple of our options here, okay? These are the options that we have for working with null. We're going to talk about both of them. Right, so there's two. There's one called the safe uh, dot operator, and then there's also the non-null asserted dot operator. Okay, just you know, even if you haven't seen these before, which one looks like the right thing to use? Anybody want to take a take a guess? I mean, it does say that one of them is safe, but if you even if I just gave you these two operators, right, which one looks like it's potentially not the right thing to do, and why? I mean, both of them are a little bit more verbose than the dot, but yeah. Um, so the uh, the S thing is similar. That's because it's more powerful. It was I don't care if it's a null even, whereas this works because it is. It well, I actually said it is. Well, so, so that's an explanation of the semantics, but I'm just saying just look at the operators, right? Which one of these, and use your, use your programming intuition, which one of these looks like the right thing to do? Or put it another way, which one of these looks like the wrong thing to do? Yeah, exclamation point's like an angry punctuation mark, right? And there's two of them, right? They could have had more. It could have been like four or whatever. I guess they decided two was enough, right? So this this thing, you know, a bang, that's somehow it's referred to, like bang, bang, like this is kind of, this will draw your attention, right? If you're working, I mean, this exclamation point is not a punctuation mark in programming languages that typically mean something good, right? It's usually a warning or some sort of danger sign, right? like, watch out, right? Um, this one is a little bit friendlier, right? Um, so these, again, so these are our two choices, right? Um, and so, again, how do we get here? Kotlin knows that this variable could be null. And so it's going to stop us from working with it in a way that's unsafe. I can't just directly access it. All right, so I l let's, let's talk about the first one first, right? So the, far, the, the one that you are going to use most of the time right, is something called the safe dot operator, right? 
Save dot operator is that question mark followed by a dot. And what it does is the following. It essentially will try to evaluate this expression. But if it finds a null reference, okay, and this can these can be chained together. We'll see how to do this in a second. It will just stop. And the entire expression will evaluate to null. Okay? So let's look at how this works with this simple example. So now I've got a nullable string. When I use the safe down operator, this evaluates to null if the string is null. If the string is not null, I get the length of the string. Okay? So again, if I set if this is null, this entire expression. So what happened here is I started with S, that question mark dot says, follow this reference if the place if if it's safe, basically, right? If it's not safe, it just stops, right? Immediately, it doesn't crash, doesn't generate a runtime exception. It just evaluates that expression to null. In this case, I'm printing the expression, so what I get out of it is null. But we'll see a few cases in a minute where I'm doing something different. Okay. So let's look at an example of this used differently. Okay, right. So here I've got a nullable string on line two. And then I'm trying to assign the length of that nullable string into a value L that I've declared as an int. So what's going to happen here? So I'm using my safe down operator, right? But whenever I use the safe down operator, what's one of the possible results? So if I'm using the safe down operator, I'm using it because I might encounter null. If I encounter null, the entire expression is going to evaluate to null. And so null is one of the possible values on the right side of line three. So what's wrong with line three? What do you think? Yeah. This is an int. It's not a nullable int. So I'm telling Kotlin, this value is going to hold an integer. But Kotlin knows that this expression might return null. So I can't compile this. So one of the ways you can think about this is this is sort of a way of propagating null through your program. Right? If this finds null, it will return null. Okay? So now, sometimes, we're going to see a way to stop the propagation in a minute. Right? But sometimes what this means is now I have to sort of deal with null more places than I might have wanted to, right? So now, in order to get this to work, I have to allow my integer to take a nullable length, because this might be null. Um, but now what happens here, right? So if I infer this, it's going to do the right thing. It's going to say this is a nullable int, but now what's going to happen? Now let's say I want to do some math with this. What do you think? So what's the what's the type of L? I didn't have to specify it, but what's Kotlin going to infer that to be? What's that? of L, it's the length, right? So this is a nullable string. This is the safe down operator here. Length it would normally be an int, but because I'm using the safe down operator, it could also be null. So this is a nullable int. So can I do math with a nullable int? No. Right, so this is not going to work. Right, because what I have now is a nullable int. This is sort of a strange error message, but what it's essentially saying is that um, you can't do math with null. Right? Null doesn't add to things. Okay. So this is the first tool, and, and again, this is required by Kotlin. So whenever Kotlin um, has sees you working with something that could be null, it will force you to use uh, this this safe dot operator. Right. You might think this is going to be a huge pain. It turns out to be actually pretty nice because, as we'll look at toward the end of class, Kotlin also knows when nullable values could be null and does a good job of not forcing you to use this when you don't need to. Okay. Any questions on, on this so far? So I can chain these, right? 
And this is something you see a lot. I've got an object reference that contains a reference to another object that contains a reference to another object, and I want to follow that chain safely. Some of the values might be null, right? If they're null, I don't want to, I can't keep going, right? Once I get to a null, it's like a dead end, right? I have to stop, right? So here, I've got two data classes. I've got my person class, which contains a nullable value that could refer to an instance of name, which is another data class, or it could refer to null. And then that name has class right now only has one field, which is a nullable string. Um, I initialize these both to null. And so now here I'm walking this chain of references, right? Basically I want to compute or I want to store the length of the name if it exists. But in order for the name to, ex the first name to exist, the name object has to exist. It might be null, okay? The person definitely exists. So that's one thing Kotlin knows, right? So it doesn't force me to use the safe operator here because the inferred type of this value is going to be um, a person, not a nullable person, right? So this is okay. This one is safe because person will never be null. This one is, I have to use the safe dot operator because name could be null. And then this one I have to use the save dot operator because first could be null. And then here I need to use the save, right, sorry, that's what I just said. So here I need to use the save dot operator. And I can essentially, again, chain these together to provide sort of safe access deep into a nested, nested structure. Some of you, some of you probably, if you took 125 a couple semesters ago, we did a, we did a, like an assignment that was more specifically focused on JSON, and we encourage people to kind of use this pattern of putting this under a try-catch, which I'll show you in a second, right? Which kind of does the same thing. This is a lot more elegant, right? So, so Colin is also going to propagate null values uh, through the chain, and it's going to propagate the use of the save dot operator, right? So let me show you a couple more examples here. So here, my data class, you'll see that the name is non-nullable. So now I'm saying every single person will have a name that's a non-null reference, okay? The name, however, has a field first, which could be null. In fact, the default value is null. So let's look at the comparison above. Well, actually, we can, yeah, let's look at this, right? So here, name could be null, and the contents, the value inside name could be null. Here, name is never null. So I don't need to use the safe dot operator here. I had to use it here. I can omit it here. Kotlin knows that the person will always be non-null, so I can follow that safely. It knows the name will always be non-null. So I can follow that safely. Once I get to first, now I'm, now I'm in trouble. Right now I'm in more dodgy territory, so I have to use the safe dot operator. So this example is a little bit different, and you might wonder why it looks a little bit different. So here, every name has a first val has a first val, right? That's a string. So if I have a name, I always have uh, a valid string, but every person doesn't always have a name. Sometimes the name is null. The way the, safe dot o the way the safe dot operator works is that as soon as I encounter null, I've got to keep using it throughout the rest of the chain. So even though if I have a name, right, then I definitely, then that name will definitely have a first component. I still need this here, right? If I take that off, so we can try it. If I remove this, it's going to complain. Right. Um, so as soon as I get to a point in my reference chain where something could be null, I have to continue to use the save dot operator as I go through that. Yeah, question. So if I didn't have the safety thing for name, uh, it's a great question. So what happens here, like this? So. Let me just emphasize this, this is really important. This code won't compile. There's no way to even run this. 
so it can't crash. Code that can't compile can't crash. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is actually, it, it's a great point, right? If you can't compile the code, you can't ship it and you can't run it, right? So it can't crash in front of anybody. This code, the Kotlin compiler stopped me and said, this is wrong. You got to fix this, right? This didn't like blow up in somebody's face, you know, when they tried to open my app or whatever. Okay, and that's one of the cool things about Kotlin. Other questions about this before we go on? We're also seeing some data classes and stuff like that. There might be some new things up here on the slides for you guys, particularly if you haven't been to every class. Okay, now, yeah, so just, just to briefly kind of show you how you would do this in Java. So here's like the Java equivalent, right? Is that I put this under a try, right? Any sort of unsafe property access that I want to do, I put this under a try catch. And that way, if there was a null pointer exception, I can still continue to, to speak, right? The difference here, and this goes back to your question, is that two things. First of all, the dot operator, you can see this example up here, is a lot more elegant, more convenient, and the compiler forces me to use it when I need it. I cannot not use it. There's no way. No, Kotlin's goal is basically, if your code compiles, then it has to be handling null values safely. It does give you a little bit of an escape hatch here, which we're going to talk about in a second. But in general, you know, Kotlin really tries to force you to work safely with them. Okay. So now we've seen kind of how do I how to identify null and how to sort of collapse, propagate null values into my code, right? And again, I'll go back to this example, right? So here I've got a string that could be null. I grab its length, but because the string could be null, the length could also be null. And now I don't have an int. I have this thing that's an int question mark, meaning that it could be null, and Kotlin's going to prevent me from doing anything useful with it, like using it in math or whatever. Right? Now, we could, you can, you can fix this, right? You can fix this with like a big blob of code, right? So I could essentially assign l my length using an if expression. So I could say if the length of the string is null use, uh, sorry, if the length is not null, right, so this, and I could actually, sorry, I'll say this, if s is not null, then use the length of the string, otherwise use zero, and now what I get back, what I get into l is an int. It's no longer an int question mark, a nullable int. It's an actual int, and so now I can do that. Okay. But this is kind of terrible, right? I don't want so this is sort of like this trade-off Colin is making at the language level. It's saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to work with null more carefully, um, but I'm also going to give you some tools for doing this in a way that's not a huge pain in the butt. All right. So instead, Colin provides this other tool that's called the Elvis operator. This is not unique to Colin. This is something that a few other languages have. It takes different forms. Um, the Elvis operator... Anybody know why the Elvis operator is called the Elvis operator? I didn't know either. I had to look it up. So apparently if you if you look at it sideways, I guess it's supposed to like look a little bit like Elvis's hairdo because of the, the question mark. Anyway, I used to think it was about like maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but Elvis is I don't know, that doesn't have anything to do with Elvis. So so this is the Elvis operator. It also looks a little bit like a ternary operator, except there's no middle portion of it, okay? So essentially, here's how the Elvis operator works. It separates two parts of, it separate, it's got two sides to it. It's got a left side and a right side, okay? If this is non-null, if the left side's not null, you get the left side. Otherwise, you get the right side, okay? Or I should say, otherwise, the right side is evaluated. So here, I'm saying, give me the length of s if the safe down operator evaluates to null because s is null, then I, then I get zero, right? So this is like a default value, is another way to think about it, right? If this whole left part of this is, uh, if any part of the left side evaluates to null, so if I'm using the safe down operator, if I get to null somewhere in my chain, 
here if the thing I'm starting with is null, then I get the right side. Otherwise, I get the left side. And so now I can essentially accomplish the same thing I accomplished up here with this big blob of, of, of an if statement in a single line. Yeah, question? Mm -hmm. Right here. Ah, we'll get there. Yeah. So that, that the so so the question is, um, if I check this, do I still need to do this? The answer is no, and we'll talk about why. Yeah, you're 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 a few minutes ahead of me. Okay. So this turns out, you know, the office operator turns out to be a pretty pretty powerful thing, uh, particularly when you're working with null, because there's a lot of times in which you know. I have like a, if, if I can't perform a computation on something then I'm gonna use some other value or I want to adjust the control flow of my program in some way. Um, the right side of the Elvis operator does not have to set a value. It can also just bail out. So here's a way to just bail out, okay? And again, this is dumb because I just should just return this rather than using the Elvis operator, but I can have a return on the right side of my Elvis operator. So here what happens is if you pass a null string to this function, which will accept a null string, the parameters marked as string, question mark, or a nullable string. If you pass a null string and this save dot operator evaluates the null, then I get to the right side of this expression and I just return. So none of this other code gets executed. Otherwise, I return like this string, which again is sort of silly. Let's put a print statement in here just so we can convince ourselves that this is happening. I will run it. So you see when I run it on null, here doesn't get printed because I bailed out on the right side of the else operator. Otherwise I get down here. The other thing to, to keep in mind here, let's let's just convince ourselves of this, right? Is that now Kotlin has inferred L to be an int, okay? Because it knows, you know, there's the Kotlin compiler is smart enough to, to determine a fair amount about the control flow of your program. So basically, here's how it thinks about this. It says, okay, I know that s, the parameter to this function, could be null. And now I see a, a safe dot operator being used on the left side of an Elvis expression. If I get to the right side, it means that s was null. And, but I return. So if, the, if this is evaluated and used to set l, then l cannot be null. So I know that by the time I get down to line four, I can now do math with L because L is actually a valid int. Okay. So, so Kotlin will, 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 will is, is able to, the Kotlin compiler, a little slower than the Java compiler, but also is discovering out, is discovering a lot more about your program as it goes. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm <coughs> just so. To go back to our, if, you're, if we're building a mental model based on Java, this is sort of like this, right? Where I declare a variable outside of my try catch. I try doing something with a variable that could be null, which in Java is basically every variable that I can create. <coughs> if I had a null pointer exception, I set the value to something, right? Or do something there. I could also return it. Okay. Any questions about these two things so far? All right, second option, so, so the first option and really the one you normally want to use is you want to use a combination of the safe dot operator, which again will collapse any expression that contains a null that's not safe to follow into null, and then use the Elvis operator to set default values when you need to, or to just bail out, right? Like you might have a function that needs to compute some things and if certain fields are missing from the objects that you need to use, you just return a value or throw an exception or whatever, okay? If, for some reason, and there's times, we've seen one already when we were working with our little uh, KTOR example, right? If for some reason you want the Java behavior, you want it really badly, you're desperate to throw an exception if you find null, right? You miss that about Java. You can do that. And again, there's times in which this is the right thing to do. So. This is the non-null assertion operator. Two bangs and a dot, okay? 
This is your other option when working with null. So if Java, sorry, if Kotlin determines a variable might be null, you got to either use that safe dot operator or this non-null assertion operator. So what will happen, again, I promised you that you can make this blow up, and you can. It does the same thing that Java would do. It will throw a null pointer exception if it encounters null. You can catch that in a catch statement. That's how we handled invalid parameters when we were building our, our simple web API. So sometimes, not often, sometimes this is the right thing to do, right? If you want to throw, right? If you want this expression to actually throw an exception, right? Um, so again, you can, you can get the same behavior that you would see in Java, but you're, you're required to use this operator, which again, you know, after having read a fair amount of Kotlin code now, like really does draw your attention to the fact that this is happening, right? So when you see this, you'll see this, and it's kind of like it jumps off the page a little bit because of those two exclamation points, right? So again, this is not normally what we want. Um, you know, why use Kotlin in the first place if, if you just want to generate no pointer exceptions all over the place? You can do that with Java. Um, but there are times in which this is the right thing to do. Okay, so now for the last few minutes, I want I want to just talk about when you need to use these operators. Okay, <coughs> so there's two different things that the Kotlin compiler is going to think about. One is whether or not the value is nullable. If the value is not nullable, you do not need to use these operators. Okay, because it can't be null and it cannot be unsafe to access its fields or methods. This works almost all the time. And the other day, the, just yesterday, I was working on some Kotlin code, and I was having this problem where it was actually throwing a null pointer exception, which I thought was really strange. And it was because it was interacting with a library that, wasn't, that was claiming that the value was not null when it was actually returning null. Right? So this isn't perfect, right? Um, but it works 99% of the time. So for something like this, for example, I don't need to use the safe dot operator. And if you use like IntelliJ, it'll tell you like this is unnecessary. It's a warning. You can use it, right? But it's never going to be triggered. Um, you'll also see cases where if you try to use an Elvis operator, it'll tell you, I'm never going to get to the right side of this Elvis operator. So just don't bother, right? OK, but let's, let's look at something like this, right? So now there's some control flow involved. So I've got a function called string length. It takes a nullable string, returns an integer. If the string is null, I return zero. Otherwise, I return the length of the string. So when we read this code, what do we know about what happens inside that else? Well, we know if we got into the else, it means that s isn't null. So the question is, does Kotlin know this or not? And the answer, happily, is it does. Uh, Kotlin is, the Kotlin compiler is very good at figuring this stuff out. And there's a whole different, there's a bunch of different varieties of this type of thing, right? Um, so for example, uh, here's one of them, right? Which is basically if s is null, return. Otherwise, I return s.length. If I get into the statement, Kotlin knows that s is not null. And so I no longer have to use the safe.operator. I can also do things like this, right? So let's take off the let's take off the the else statement and then let's say say it's just gonna be a silly example and let's return d and so again this is gonna work just the same way so essentially once I get to line five Kotlin is smart enough to realize that, look, if S was null, we would have never gotten here before. So it does a certain degree of what's called static analysis on, on your program, right? Uh, it can't determine in all cases, right? So for example, um, what about if we did something like this? Let's add a second parameter here. And now we'll pass one. We'll pass one in. All right. What about now? Do you think this is going to work? 
remember this is the, the Kotlin compiler is performing a, 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 f a form of analysis on your code that's called static analysis. Static analysis is done without any understanding of how the code is actually executed. Okay, so why why is this not going to work? Yeah. What's that? Where's that? Here? Oh, no, no, that's fine. What's creating the problem here? So again, if I, if I run this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be angry, right? So now what Kotlin is telling me is I can't guarantee that S is not null when I get to line 5, and it's kind of forcing me to use the not null operator again. What is the problem? Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, so the problem is that I've created this new condition and this condition depends on runtime information. It depends on the value of V. Okay? So the problem is if I call this with zero, then I know that I'll hit that return statement. If I call it with one, I don't. And again, what, what the Kotlin compiler is capable of doing is static analysis. So static analysis doesn't have any information about the runtime behavior of this code. So the static analyzer is now going to bail out because it's going to say, look, I don't know when B is zero, right? Maybe it's always zero. Maybe you never call this with any other value, but it doesn't matter, right? I can't guarantee that uh, before I execute the code. So again, I take this out, and I'm good because now this, well, now it's angry about the, only things that the only way I get to line five is if s is not null. Right. Let's look at a different example. This is sort of a fun one. Um, what about this? So now, like I can in Kotlin, I'm declaring my string s outside the function. This is just a top-level variable. I can do this in Kotlin. I can't do it in Java, but I can do it in Kotlin. I can declare functions as top-level objects in my code, I can declare variables as top level objects. So why isn't this going to work? Or will it work? What do you guys think? What do you think? Sure. Anybody have an idea about? Well, let's try. We can try it. See what happens. All right. So a, a, a somewhat um, inscrutable error message it says. Smart cast the string is impossible because S is immutable property could have changed by this time. Somebody want to translate that to English for me? Listen, th I mean, this is this is forcing you to think about something that's slightly interesting here, right? And and we'll, we're actually going to come back later in the semester. We'll talk about concurrency and Kotlin using coroutines a little bit. But um, what's the problem? Yeah, exactly, right? So S is a variable now that's available to anybody. It's a global variable, essentially. Anybody can modify it. I modified it here, outside of that function. It's a top-level variable that I can set at any point in this program. So the problem is, when string length runs, it's going to check whether S is null, right? But what happens if I check that s is not null, and then before I get to this line of code, some other part of my program that's running at the same time changes the value of s. Right? Again, is, uh, how many, you guys have taken 241? How many people have taken 241? How many people have thought about multiple things in their program running at the same time, that that's a thing? Ooh, you guys are going to have fun later. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so it's possible in your program that I can actually have multiple streams of execution. I can have multiple things that are happening at the same time. And again, we'll look at how to do this in Kotlin later in the semester. This is one of Kotlin's other cool features. Um, but here what could happen is that in between the time that I check that it's null and that I get into that else statement and actually access the length, somebody could have set it to null, right? And so Kotlin is now again going to force me to use the save dot operator if I can type it properly. Oh yeah. Oh right. Well, actually, now it's now it's even going to force me to return a nullable int. Let's use the uh, all this operator here. There we go. So again, what's so let's go back and look at this. Why why don't I have the same problem here? Yeah, so when I have a variable that's inside a function like this, it can't be changed by somebody outside. This is every time string length runs, every copy of string length has its own um, copy of s that's unique to it. Nobody else has access to. So here, the compiler can convince itself that there's no way for this to be, no way for this to be changed. Right? Again, like I said, we'll come back and talk more about coroutines. Um, when uh, we talk about concurrency in a little bit. All right, you guys are well versed on null now. A few minutes for questions. Any questions about null support? On Friday, we're going to talk more about class design. We'll just sort of introduce you to some of Kotlin's object-oriented features. That's probably going to be review for a lot of people that have seen this in Java before. Um, any questions about null? Get in there. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah. If I use the double exclamation point, will it make what faster? No. Uh, that's a good. Uh, well, I I think. Actually, when you do that, the compiler, the, so the question is, if I use the double bang time, uh, will that cause the compiler to run faster? I don't know. Uh, well, I guess I have three answers to that. One is that I don't know. Um, I mean, Kotlin is still going to do a lot of other analysis on the program. So just using that in one or two places is not going to help, right? The second response is that you don't care how long the compiler takes. You want the compiler to take longer if it's capable of finding errors for you, right? You know, the, the, the fact that, um, you know, certain modern languages have compilers that are, a little, that are a little bit slower is not a problem. It depends on what the compiler is doing, right? If the compiler is finding a lot of potential errors for you, then you want it to be slow. The purpose of that, so there are times, right? So um, I could pull up that code, but next time we go back to the um, to our web API, ask that question again, right? There are times in which what I want to happen is if there's a missing value, I actually want it to generate an exception because then I'm going to use a catch handler to figure out what to do, right? Um, there are other times in which I have a default value in mind or I have some way of working around it, and then then I would use the save dot operator, right? You can always use so so again. Go, let's go back and look at the double, the non-null asserted operator again. Um, so here I can always do this inside a try catch. Yeah, it's spelled right. This is fine, right? Sometimes this is what I, what I want, right? So when we when we were building our, our web API, what we did is that if the parameters were missing in the request that we were expecting, we used this to return a bad request, right? Uh, and that's fine, right? So there again, there are times in which this is the right thing to do. I don't want to scare you into thinking that this is incorrect all the time, but um, 
it's, it's something that you need to be careful with. Any other questions? All right, I'll see you guys on Friday.